Before I get into uh, the meat of the talk, though, I'd first uh, like to just thank uh, Francis and all the great uh, Goruko folks. Uh, this is uh, quite a conference, a lot of fun so far. Give them a big round of applause. I'd also uh, I'd like to thank you folks uh, for coming out and supporting the Ruby community. And uh, it's conferences like this that I think are a big part of, of what make the community special. I uh, came out here from, from L.A., but I grew up in Detroit, so I have no problem saying I love New York City, and uh, it's, uh, it's been too long since I've been here, so it's a great opportunity to come out and, and meet a lot of new folks. <clears throat> a little bit, just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, in the program it says uh, that uh, I'm from AT&T Interactive as of about three days ago, that's no longer true. I moved to a startup in Santa Monica called SharesPost.com. If you've ever thought to yourself, man, I'd like to get in on uh, buying some Facebook stock or Twitter stock, that's what we're trying to make possible, uh, private equity trading. <clears throat> Uh, I'm also the lead developer for, for Waves, and uh, I, it, it, in the role that I had at AT&T, I was doing a lot more uh, managing, so my GitHub account shows a little bit of a lull in commits over the last few months. I'm hoping to kind of get back and be a little bit more hands-on, uh, but I still am allegedly the lead developer for Waves. Uh, there's some of my contact info there, and, and part of the fun for me of doing these talks is, is meeting all of you folks. So I genuinely hope that you will, if there's anything in here at all that's interesting or that you think you might at some point uh, uh, want to talk more about or you have ideas that you think uh, might influence the direction that, that we're trying to go with this project, I really do hope that you'll uh, reach out and get in touch and we can get to know each other. <clears throat> Google, a couple of days ago at uh, Google I.O., announced uh, a project called Google Wave. So <laughs> I'm either now faced with changing the name or answering the question about what this has to do with Google, which is nothing, uh, at least not with that project, nothing directly. Also, thanks to uh, a certain incident, I've had to uh, do away with the Surfer Babe, which was at the end of each one of my presentations. I won't say any more on that. <laughs> so first, uh, I want to pimp waves a little bit. I think I've made the mistake in the past on these of uh, not really talking enough about what waves uh, really can do today already. It's not a, um, I mean, it is under development, uh, but it's, uh, it's in use on production systems. It's a fairly sophisticated framework already. Uh, I tend to like to talk more about the things that we're going to try to do in the future than what it already does, but I don't want to sell the framework short, so I'm going to talk real quickly uh, about um, a couple of things that, about Waves, just to kind of give you an idea about what it already does. So there seems to be a couple of different uh, themes in terms of uh, Ruby development. Initially, it was all about MVC and Rails. Uh, that was the big sort of... Uh, well, initially, it was uh, before Rails, it was about a lot of other things, but uh, the really big kind of, you know, Ruby blowing up and coming of age was uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the emergence of a, of a viable MB MBC framework. Then we sort of started getting into an area where people started saying, you know, I don't always need a full-fledged full uh, MVC framework, so I want to do something real simple. A lot of people have used Sinatra for that. I just want to make the case that you can come pretty close to uh, the kind of compactness that you get with Sinatra but just by using Waves. And what you see here is an example of the power of one of Waves' core features, which is, uh, and this just illustrates one aspect of it. Hopefully uh, the code is big enough to read, probably maybe not, but uh, it has, uh, basically it, it has a nice DSL for accessing and, and mapping to HTTP requests that you can sort of use in a lot of different contexts. So it's a little different than conventional MVC style routing uh, that you see with, uh, say, Rails. Uh, and uh, so I can match on a lot of things, the accept header, the query, uh, and I can do it, you know, as not, it's not, it's not a uh, unnatural thing to do. So in this case, you see I'm matching, I'm saying, look, there must be a query parameter in the, in the request called name. <clears throat> 
there are uh, a number of, of those kinds of, of primitives. In this case, we're using uh, the compact foundation, which allows me to build a very, very sort of small, compact, kind of Sinatra-like app. But if I get new requirements, um, you know, I can also go uh, to, uh, to, to handle more sophisticated things. This is a more traditional web app that uses what's called the MVC foundation. So these foundations are sort of pluggable into waves and give waves different kind of character depending on what your requirements are. The nice thing about that is you can start simple and, uh, and then as your application evolves, you can, you can bring in whatever foundation makes sense or additional what we call layers. So a foundation is made up of layers. <clears throat> uh, you can build your own foundations. So this is an example, one of the, uh, I think uh, both uh, Gregory and Eleanor mentioned uh, Rubinius. So one of the Rubinius developers has been working on a, a uh, DSL for building more restful web apps and uh, was able to add that in as a foundation. So this is an experimental foundation that's been being worked on uh, by Eros and Akari. Another one, uh, this is a little bit more of, for services. This is one that uh, I had proposed. We haven't implemented this one, but these are the kinds of things. And then this is more about what I'm, so this transitions into kind of going forward. Um, so here you see the, an attempt to sort of represent a, uh, uh, a, 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 an actual resource server uh, with a DSL that directly expresses the, uh, the abstractions around uh, uh, REST computing and resource oriented. Some other things, so again, Waves is, is pretty full featured. Um, it has uh, things like inheritable configurations that Rails still does not have. I've actually thought about pulling that out and some of the other features into a gem. Uh, there are uh, really nice kind of decoupled uh, implementations for workers and uh, dispatchers. So you can really, you know, really do quite a bit in terms of uh, customizing uh, and creating your own sort of flavor of, of web server. Uh, some of the other features there, I won't go through them all, except to mention one in particular. Uh, I think it was Gregory had mentioned uh, how great JRuby is. We've had the same experience. Um, and the nice thing with JRuby is, from a scalability standpoint, it's very simple to deploy, right? Because you don't really have to figure out how many, uh, I think Eleanor mentioned, you know, letting, the, uh, letting somebody else do the work of figuring out how to leverage a multi-core architecture. And JVMs sort of have that characteristic, right? There's somebody that's spent uh, probably a whole team of people on any given architecture that have spent a lot of time making sure that a given JVM is optimized for a given systems architecture. And you can leverage that, you just run one JVM and you can basically scale up to the limit of the machine uh, and there's nothing, there's nothing more to do. And we've been doing that, not on huge load, but, but actual production stuff just uh, has never gone down and we've been running that for months uh, on uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of requests. Now, one of the things that I get a lot uh, after I go through uh, some of the more arcane, interesting things that we're trying to accomplish with Waves is people saying, you know, that's fascinating, uh, but it doesn't really uh, impact me at all. I, everything I'm doing really fits perfectly well within the uh, MVC paradigm. And that's uh, probably true for, for most of you. And I, you know, I'm not trying to uh, make your life more complicated. <clears throat> but... Uh, what this really is is a symptom of the fact that the, the, the by far the most successful uh, web client was is the browser, but that's not necessarily going to be the case uh, for the indefinite future. Uh, we've already sort of seen people start to start to do things within the browser where they're effectively tunneling with things like uh, AJAX and Comet, right? And uh, you know we're really starting to do more and more stuff where. Um, you start to worry about, hey, I should set the accept header in the request, or um, you know, I don't want to rely on uh, the browser's built-in content negotiation in some fashion. And with the, uh, with the emergence, I think the last time I checked on Programmable Web a few months back, there was well over a thousand uh, publicly available APIs. Uh, that's going to continue to grow. I think more and more of our applications are going to be 
putting together multiple APIs, right? So um, mobile is a big inflection point where we see these sort of hybrid clients where people want to build sort of uh, native functionality, but they also want to, to leverage the fact that they have a server um, that has that, that where they can update some features or update the business logic and so on and not have to release a new app. And I think that starts to go towards, uh, you know, more and more where we're going to see uh, people really using the web as a services infrastructure and not just something where, you know, you have a way to, to put an app in a browser. So my favorite example of this is uh, how many of you are familiar with an open source project uh, called Boxy? So we already see um, the, uh, the IPTV coming to us, right? The Apple TV sort of has one. It's only a matter of time before, uh, I'd, by the way, I'd, I'd love to see a, a, a Ruby <laughs> Boxy. I don't know if anybody's working on something like that, but if you are, please let me know. Um, but, it, but once you get there, you know, you start to realize, hey, you know, the potential for interactive TV for, let's say you're watching a news program, right? And uh, there's something that you do, some, some country or person that you want to know more about. And, but, uh, you know, the, the, the natural language is being parsed as it comes through and things are popping up on the bottom of the screen. I click on the name, it brings up uh, some information or data about, uh, about that particular thing. Uh, how many of you have been following the Wolfram Alpha uh, launch? So there's another example, right, where this guy has built a search engine that sort of semantically parses uh, web, web content and allows, uh, makes it possible to do some analysis. So I think we're moving more and more towards a very, very different kind of web. And so if it hasn't impacted you yet, uh, you know, it's something to kind of keep your eye on that, uh, you know, the MVC view of the world and the browser-centric view of the world isn't going to be with us forever. And one of the profound things about this is HTTP itself is actually not MVC, and I'll talk about what it is uh, here in a minute. But one of the things I want to get across, and, and uh, this kind of goes to the theme of uh, using not just Ruby, but really uh, the web itself to its full potential, uh, you've heard the, the, I don't know, there's some statistic that we only use like 3% of our brains or something. And we really only use about 3% of the power of, of the web. And the idea is that Waves is there to help you um, as, uh, as, your, as our collective requirements evolve past MVC, Waves is there to sort of help us figure out uh, how, to, uh, you know, how, how to write frameworks and, and build applications that take advantage of that. Uh, so again, you saw earlier I talked about the foundations and layers. Waves just is, is much more flexible than traditional frameworks. It allows you to mix in the features that you want uh, and then uh, um, build, on, build from there. So you can start very simply and then go on. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, um, the, the terminology I'm using. Uh, REST is a, a very controversial term, right? And if anybody's followed uh, Roy Fielding's blog, you know that he's very irritable. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that uh, he gets kind of, I think, reasonably upset about is he invented the term REST and then finds himself in, in arguments with people about what it means. So you can imagine, uh, it reminds me of, of, if any of you are old enough to remember use cases and when they first started, and a guy named Ivar Jakobsen invented the concept, and then, you know, there was this endless debate about what use cases were, even though he'd written a book on it, and it was all pretty much defined clearly in the book. Um, REST is sort of like that, where um, I think if we want to move beyond talking about REST, an appropriate term is a resource-oriented architecture. So if, if you want to freelance a little bit and you want to get outside of of what's strictly speaking, you know, Roy's definition of REST, then I like to use the term resource-oriented for that. And resource-oriented, unlike REST, isn't just a set of constraints. We can actually talk about a real architecture and try to pin down, okay, it's HTTP-based, it's, um, you know, it's uh, got these conventions, uh, uses these standards, and so on, which, uh, like, for example, REST, it doesn't talk really specifically about HTTP at all. 
So what I'm really trying to talk about from here on out is, is HTTP-based resource-oriented architecture. <clears throat> the great thing with the web uh, is that we've already got a huge proven infrastructure in place, right? So we don't, it kind of amuses me. I had a recent discussion with a colleague who was talking about wanting to implement a custom protocol for something. And as soon as you do that, right, you kind of throw away the advantages of load balancers and uh, firewalls and all these things that are already sort of there to uh, help you scale something, help you manage it, uh, managing and monitoring, uh, you know, any kind of uh, HTTP-based service is already sort of built in. And HTTP itself is a pretty sophisticated protocol. So, uh, but, but the funny thing is there's been a, a lot of the confusion has been around the, the different verbs and how to use them. I think the best way, and I think this is, this is based on a fair amount of study of what, uh, you know, looking at the uh, REST dissertation and, and reading between the lines of Roy's blog, which is uh, a little obfuscated, I think. Uh, but when you really kind of get down to it, what you're talking about is a distributed hash table, which is an incredibly powerful uh, abstraction. So if you take, uh, you know, things like memcached or uh, uh, shared memory, Right? I mean, what we're really talking about is, is key value pairs. So it's a very, very flexible way to do a lot of different things from you know, messaging to caching to whatever. Uh, and uh, this is what HTTP is providing us, a distributed hash table. And that makes a lot more sense of the verbs because now you can sort of see the construction, right? Get and put and delete. And uh, you can use uh, uh, you know, head to sort of check to see if a value is there. Well, Dan, you know, what about post? Well, post is sort of everything else. Post is the fallback, and uh, it, it's not at the same sort of level. It's not of the same level of primacy. The other verbs, for example, are idempotent. Post is not, and the reason for that is because we know the semantics of the other verbs. They're defined much more clearly. Post is saying, look, not everything fits cleanly in the constructs of a distributed hash, so I'm going to define uh, a, uh, a, a different... Uh, verb that allows you to sort of do whatever else you want that that you know might not fit efficiently in a distributed hash abstraction. <clears throat> so what goes in the hash are these things called resources, and uh, we put things in and out using representations. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the split here. The keys are the URIs, and we put representations in and out, but we're really putting resources in and out of this of this big hash. So what's a resource? Well, it's really, an, it's kind of, if you think back to your object-oriented programming days, what we're really talking about is objects, except that in objects, usually we're talking about within a single programming language, right? So we don't worry too much about uh, the difference between the representation of an object and the actual object itself. In the cloud, however, we are assuming a very, very heterogeneous environment where the odds are, in fact, that the client and server are going to be different platforms. So what we want is a platform-neutral way to approach this problem. And I think on top of that, you know, objects are sort of, the, the term is overloaded. So the nice thing is saying, look, let's just forget about all the history here, but, but remember the construct. We want some kind of thing of saying this is an entity, a thing, a, a, a noun. And uh, now, so I've got my, I've got my uh, resource. And then in order to support n number of platforms, I've got my representations of that resource. So I'm taking the concept of an object, splitting it into two pieces. Again, going back a little bit, if you're old enough to remember, this is like the holy grail of computing. This is a big deal. Uh, there's been many, many attempts to solve this problem. And HTTP, sort of while we were sleeping, as it were, uh, has actually solved the problem quite elegantly. Uh, but I think resource-oriented goes a little bit beyond even that. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Resource Description Framework, RDF? I think it's something that's worth getting familiar with. Uh, and the reason is that it's sort of a crucial, you need something like RDF. If you're familiar with service-oriented architecture, uh, you, you, you've probably seen WSDLs and XML schemas and so on. Well, RDF is kind of the the uh, restful answer to those things. It's much more flexible. It sort of unifies uh, both the schema side of it and the resource description side of it into a single uh, framework that's quite extensible. 
You should check out Freebase to kind of get a, a freebase.com, I believe it is, to get sort of an initial idea of the kind of power of, of RDF. And what RDF allows you to do is sort of provide a generic standard entry point into a, a set of resources so that uh, you don't have a whole lot of things where a programmer has to sit down and read your documentation to figure out how to call your services. And what we're really trying to do is the same thing that I think Ruby has done quite elegantly itself as a language, right, which is principle of least surprise and, and uh, that sort of begets all kinds of uh, benefits is if you get a nice elegant architecture underneath the covers, you know, you start finding that you could do things that you didn't realize you could do. You can combine things. Uh, and that, that, you know, you hadn't thought of combining when you first designed a system. And so going beyond the original conception or design of a system, that's sort of the essence of mashups as well. And that's what cloud computing, I think, is really going to be all about. So being able to have a, a, a sort of machine-readable and discoverable and dynamically composable set of services is actually the key to, you know, getting uh, this kind of fusion reaction inside of the cloud. I just, I just made that metaphor up off the top of my head. <clears throat> a great case study of this is uh, RSS and Atom, where I don't really need to know the specific link structure of your blog. I don't care whether you made your URLs readable or if they're uh, MD5 hashes. I don't care. Because I have, a, what, in effect, sort of an RDF file. It's a little bit, it's sort of a derivative of RDF. Um, that describes the structure of your blog. And in fact, uh, because it, it also provides for content negotiation, we got the un unintended consequence of podcasts came out of that, right? Where I could describe other media types uh, besides just an HTML web page. And I can get all of this with a single link. And that's the kind of the key thing we're looking for is I can write generic clients I can give you an RDF for my serve, for server for a given service or services, and you can take it from there because that's the only dependency uh, that there, that I have, and uh, that's kind of the essence of loose coupling. And so we've we've already seen it in action. And if you if you kind of ever get like, okay, wait, why am I doing this again? If as you're playing around with these things, uh, you know, this is what we're trying to get to. Now I'm gonna sort of, um, yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> thought somebody was raising their hand. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through just some, some different practical examples of wins in HTTP that I think are interesting and that we're trying to make easier to uh, take advantage of in, in waves. <clears throat> Uh, one of them is, is the notion of edge caching. HTTP has an incredibly brilliant way of, of handling caching. Well, it's actually kind of more the definition of caching in a sense. Uh, what we think of, in, in particularly I think in the MVC world, we think of caching in terms of uh, offloading things from, our, from, the, from the database. Uh, but from a scalability standpoint, you know, what you really want is to offload it from your server entirely. And, uh, the caching policies that HTTP already provides, which allows the actual client to cache things, so it doesn't even go across the network at all. A request is never made because I know this data is, is in all likelihood still good, is a, 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 in a lot of ways a much, much bigger win than using something like memcached. In Waves, for example, you could uh, use rack cache, and, or you could just do this with rack as well, but you can write a simple wave server um, put it out in front of, of, of your different application servers to handle caching and, on, and offload it from your servers entirely. Uh, but, but you don't really even need that because a lot of intermediaries uh, you know, re, uh, along the way, uh, no matter how many hops it takes, I mean, it can either get cached at the client or if I as a client have never seen this data before, it may be you know, one of the intermediate hops that, I, um, that I'm looking at will have seen it. So if you ever have used like CDNs or anything like that, this is the same concept. Uh, but we can apply this to our applications. We don't really uh, necessarily need, uh, you know, to, to have CDNs and or just memcache. I mean, you can do this yourself. Another example is uh, making the network itself smarter, or another example, I guess, of making the network smarter uh, is refactoring things that are complex or error-prone, like security uh, uh, protocols, 
uh, out into a, uh, um, a, a firewall type of, of node so that anything that you launch can now actually um, use the, the same implementation. So you get one implementation of something like OpenID, you get it right, and now you just can use that across all of your servers instead of trying to embed it within each single server. And again, uh, Waves allows you to do things like you don't really need a URI. It's not a URI-centric. The, the HTTP request handling is not URI-centric. So um, you don't even need to define a URI. I can say, look, on, on any request uh, that's, a, that's a post, put, or delete, I want to make sure that it's an authenticated request. And now I've just picked that up for my entire, no matter how many nodes I might have, no matter how many different applications I might be running, uh, I, I now know that I, there's no way requests are getting through that aren't authenticated. Now you can, of course, do that uh, in many firewalls. You can do things like that as well. But uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to use the same kind of application logic um, you know, where I, I just want to write a, a Ruby open ID uh, uh, server or client, really. Um, to, to check authentication, right? And uh, so I do that, and uh, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have to worry about that on each one of my applications, and I don't have to go into a, a configuration uh, that's not in Ruby in order to do it. Another kind of in, interesting best practice is, is that a lot of times uh, people using the term RESTful kind of violate this uh, rather badly is... Uh, Instead of, in this example, I've got a link as the, the value of, for updates and fans. So I've got this sort of Twitter clone. Instead of followers, I've got fans. And um, so, you know, now the URLs there are sort of semantically meaningful, but they could be anything. The point is, again, that the client doesn't have to know them in advance because they're embedded in the, the data. The, the da it's like a reference in the data. And what you'll see, though, with a lot of APIs is they won't even have those attributes at all. Instead, what they'll have is a, some, a web page that says, okay, now if you happen to need to get the fans of a user or followers or whatever, call this URL. And that, uh, that starts to increase the coupling between the client and the server. I now have more things that the client has to sort of know about in advance. If I just put the links inside the data that I'm returning, then uh, I have uh, you know, this sort of nice property that I can change that URL to anything and, and the client will still work properly. Uh, another thing that you sort of see a lot is people putting the format specifier in the URL. Again, this is a bad practice just because what I'm trying to do is describe a, a key for a resource. I don't want to specify the representation as well. And when you look at uh, uh, linked data, you can kind of see the value of this, right? Because I, I don't know, you know, what if the client decides, hey, I want to get the followers as a web page, or I want to get it as JSON, or I want to retrieve it as XML. I mean, it should be up to the client to be able to say, I want to dereference this link, uh, and I want to get this representation. What's more is that the extensions don't really fully describe what we're asking for. If I start dealing with multiple languages, uh, now I have to have that embedded into the URL somehow. And if I have, if, if I'm dealing with, God forbid, different character sets, uh, I have to put that somehow in the URL. And all of these things increase the coupling between the client and the server. I have more things that the client sort of has to, the programmer himself, a person has to know about. So I'm, I'm losing the property, properties of machine discoverability uh, and dynamic composition by doing that. So it's rather simple, and, and I put the curl statement up here just to kind of illustrate that it's really not that hard. I mean, it, you know, you have to get used to thinking a little differently. Uh, the team that I was working with at AT&T, we've gone through a definite learning curve on, on getting used to this, and there's a lot of resistance, especially for programmers that are really, really good at the MVC paradigm. It gets, it's a little frustrating because they have to kind of unlearn some things. Uh, but once you start getting going with it, it actually starts to become quite natural because this all really makes sense. I have RDF for an entry point. I have my uh, content negotiation to decide what representations I'm getting. And I have linked data to be able to navigate to find whatever it is that I want without having to know ahead of time what the URLs are. <clears throat> so again, going back to the question of, well, what is Waves really trying to do? And I showed you earlier 
the, the, that uh, listing where we were working on a couple of different REST DSLs, one for uh, sort of resourceful web apps and one for resourceful services, because uh, it turns out they have, uh, we may be able to unify those later, but uh, uh, Iro and I have been in, in sort of in this back and forth argument about uh, whether to make services more to emphasize the services side of it, or if we should, we should have a really good way to do resourceful web apps first and then build the services off of that, I guess. is, um, And that's all happening, by the way, on the Google Groups. And again, I'd love to have more people participating and giving their two cents on it um, to kind of get it, uh, to get us to a point where, you know, we have some really useful uh, DSLs in place, what we call foundations, again, in Waves. So again, this is kind of a, it's a new, it's a new, paradigm really in a lot of ways that allows us to fully leverage the, uh, the power of the web, which is really a distributed object, distributed computing architecture that's platform and protocol neutral really. Uh, extremely powerful and we're only really using the, the you know, uh, we've only kind of uh, discovered the tip of the iceberg, I guess. So please uh, check out, we've got a new release. There's a, uh, if you go to GitHub Waves, there's a, uh, uh, stable and Edge. So Edge right now is the basis for what's going to be the 09 release. Uh, we'd love to get uh, people playing around with that. Um, you know, we'd love to have uh, other people working on foundations or taking the foundations that we have and mucking about with them and that sort of thing. So again, there's the, my contact info. Are there any uh, questions that people have? I'd be happy to take a few questions. Yeah. So um, you had said that the URL, the requesting URL itself, shouldn't specify the format of the resource. So in your example, like .xml is too specific, and to, to move that into the accept header. But um, I guess in your example, let's say if if I wanted to request shoe number one from some website, and instead of doing shoe slash one .xml. Um, and then let's say I want to see in Japanese, like where would you move that other, uh, I guess, requested format in, in, in your in the accept language? Except language. Right, yeah, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I want to actually raise a point kind of following that, which is that uh, the, the sort of the, the, the header stuff is pretty awesome in theory, but unfortunately not all the parts of the stack have implemented it yet. Um, we had a problem at Sling actually where we kind of have calls that do posts or gets, uh, and they do accept and they do accept JS. There's no dot JS or JSON or I forget what it was or whatever, but it's overwritten with it also it will turn HTML. Akamai doesn't track these. So you'll we'll, we'll get these things where someone will first hit do this get on this URL with an accept and it'll return HTML. And then a second later, someone will do a second get on the exact same. The URL is the same, but the accept is the header is different. Akamai doesn't, doesn't care. It just thinks it's giving you HTML. So we've actually had to uh, you know, be less restful, unfortunately, in, in that scenario. Now, maybe we should just not use Akamai, but obviously. So I, I, guess, I guess the point I'm raising is that like, I think all this stuff is really awesome, but I think also, like, HTTP is a set of conventions that the entire stack is sort of converging on, but they're, they're, uh, uh, it's like, how well they implement everything is a varying quality. You're, you're not supposed to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we've, had, uh, we've had similar problems. In fact, the browsers themselves will just blatantly overwrite the accept headers with uh, things sometimes uh, for, you know, like if you have a .jpg on a URL, it'll just say, okay, it's, uh, I'll accept, some, some of the browsers will just do star dot star, you know, I'll take anything, and uh, uh, there's definitely some gotchas. It's like any kind of new paradigm. You have to kind of work through the, uh, you know, the issues, and I think saying to people like Akamai, like, hey, this is a bug, man. I mean, we need, we need a, either a version of this that works for more restful stuff, or uh, we're gonna do, do use somebody else. Yes? Tech-wise defense, uh, I suspect that they're trying to work around a, a bug or an implementation detail in Internet Explorer. Um, and, um, I yeah, I think, yeah. 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 But, um, Anything that has to do with Internet Explorer is going to have to have some special yeah. features. Yeah. Um, but um, without being distracted on that.
I, I have a very fundamental question, and uh, maybe I'm just stupid, or, or maybe I am, and it still might be a good question as well. Um, but there's a lot of fuss about RESTful, and what do I lose if I say, I'll oh, forget about it, forget about it, who gives a shit? <laughs> Well, so that was the, the whole point of my talk, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I think what you lose is the, the, um, uh, this, the discoverability, the composability, the, the sort of unintended benefits that come out of synergies between all kinds of different things working the same way. You as an individual today probably don't lose a whole lot. But uh, if we all continue to sort of go off and create our own little silos, and I don't think that's where this is going. I mean, you look at things like OpenID and the, the social network APIs. I mean, clearly, uh, or Amazon's web services where I can now do monitoring and I can do auto scaling and stuff. I mean, clearly this is all moving towards this big, vast collection of services in the cloud that we're going to compose to do uh, probably today maybe 10% of what we really want to do, but it's going to increase over time. So today you probably don't pay too much of a price. But I think over time that price will increase. Eleanor? Um, well, partly to follow on from that, what you lose if you're not restful mm -hmm. is you're fighting the physics of the net. You can describe rest as a, as a distributed hash table, but the other way to look at it is it's fundamentally the physics of how data moves around networks that can lose nodes at any point in time. So you don't, it, it, for a lot of application development, it doesn't necessarily gain you anything now. But if you can leverage it, you make a lot of scalability issues just fundamentally disappear because they're part of the network structure. They're, they're not your problem, which is great. Um, but related to that, and sort of coming back to the linked data aspect, a um, couple of years, well, I, I used to work on a, some very deep geek DNS stuff. And there's an area of DNS um, called NAP2 resource records. They are exactly that. They are abstractions of URLs away from URLs. They're service oriented. And they're doing almost exactly the same thing you're doing, doing there with RDF. Only they're right the way down. They're in the network. They're in the actual lookup of machines. And uh, I mean, I've banged on about this at conferences for a couple of years now. And people sort of come up after us and go, what the hell are you on about? Data publishing in DNS. But it, it, all of this, it, it's about moving us away from caring about the physical infrastructure. And the DNS folks are trying to do it, but they, they're finding it very difficult to publicize it. Um, last year, Roy, Roy Fielding gave a, a keynote, Rouse Confura. That hall was clear of, of, from sort of like halfway back, which is clear before he was 20 minutes into what he was talking about. And there were pe I, I ran into people outside who were I don't see the point of that. What's this got to do with web development? Well, that's what the web is. If you're a web developer and you don't get that, you don't get the web. You know, and so right. that's... So that's Why I I that? I'll, I'll talk to you about that separately because it, it might be interesting stuff to actually try and fit into waves. It'll well, find yeah, some yeah. crossover. So. The, 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 uh, building that stuff into the DNS is actually a really interesting idea. Your scalability um, becomes phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it is, I think, a symptom of the, the confusion around it, I think, is related a lot to just we've been building browser apps, but the web is uh, potentially about a lot more than that. Yes? So what does this have to do with Google again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> starting already. Yes? Do you uh, have any comments on the proposed HTTP uh, patch method? No. <laughs> um, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. I haven't really looked at it. I haven't either. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes? Um, just kind of a random question, but, uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, keys to resources and caching, and the browsers are really good at figuring out how to do caching, but if you've got these keys in your um, RESTful app and your code, um, do you have to also program uh, all of the caching mechanisms into your code to decide when and where to update a new resource? Yeah, and in fact, if, uh, if you look at the... Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the question was, um, uh, 
you know, what, how much logic do you have to put into your code to manage the caching, to manage HTTP caching? Is that a fair? Yeah. Um, and in the DSL that I, the, the one that we're still kind of fiddling around with for services, uh, you'll see that, in fact, uh, in fact, I'll just quickly put this up. You'll see that, um, there we go. If you can read, I don't know if you can actually read that, but uh, one of the core things when you're defining a resource uh, is for given methods is when, when does that, uh, how long does that, is that, re that um, request cacheable for? When does, when does that object expire? So yeah, you do have to put that kind of thought into, uh, into your app. And, and, uh, but what, what the thing that we found that was sort of interesting is the more you, resources tend to be much more fine grained. I mean, it's almost at the level of uh, like when you do fragment caching, you know, if you have resources that are sort of fine grained, you get to the point where, um, you know, you, you get things like fragment caching for free. So it's, if you've gotten to the point with your apps where you're doing like fragment caching and uh, doing observers and all this kind of stuff, then uh, this is, you know, no different. It's it's probably even a little simpler. But yes, you do have to put that into the application. All right. Thank you very much.